five, we're going to cut on Marco Polo and also uh, with our YouTube and Facebook. But bless you, praise the Lord, all of you that are out there um, and that are listening to us uh, by YouTube. And we pray that you've had a wonderful, wonderful week. Amen. And to all of those that are uh, on and listening to the radio station, I know, and we're saying hello to the Taste of Freeze. You've been telling us <laughs> you've missed us on the radio, but we're so glad to be back on the air, uh, being able to uh, broadcast uh, live. And uh, you just keep on playing our music and listening to uh, our preaching um, uh, out there uh, in the Dillman area. And praise the Lord to all of you that are listening by Marco Polo, uh, those of you that are listening by YouTube uh, and this recording, and of course, all of our wonderful members that are listening by Facebook. We are just uh, delighted, so delighted that you are with us and worshiping in the beauty of holiness. Uh, and we want to uh, prepare ourselves tonight for the word of God. There's several passages of scripture and um, looking at all cameras. We've got about uh, four cameras and, and a microphone. And so as we start our uh, message on uh, tonight, uh, we want you to get several pieces of scripture I want you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter number three, and we're going to read in Jeremiah chapter number three. We're also going to read in Samuel chapter, First Samuel chapter number 16, which is a very passage of scripture, for me a passage of scripture. The book of Jeremiah uh, deals with uh, when God has his way in our life, he gives us. Uh, people in our life to bless us and then of course uh, we're just so glad and hopefully we'll be able to read in Isaiah chapter number 10 verse 27 but if you'll at least get Jeremiah 3 and then also for Samuel chapter number 6 so that we can concentrate our study on uh, tonight and before we go into uh, our Bible study, as we have uh, been doing for the last several weeks, uh, there is a song I want you to meditate. I believe this is a uh, clarion message, uh, uh, an instruction uh, to you. It's very clear. It's crisp. I want you to gather uh, this message and uh, take it in your heart and your spirit and meditate on it for the rest of this month. And as you are listening to the worship song on this evening, as you prepare yourself to get a download from the Holy Ghost.
Jesus, Lord, we honor you. We thank you. Wow, this is the day that you've made. We rejoice and we bask in your glory. You've kept us all day long. Our minds in you, stayed on you, thanking you for life and liberty and health. For that we give your name the glory for provision, protection, for direction. We thank you, O oh God. And even tonight as we come and we surrender our spirit and our mind so that we can learn from you and to give you to return to the glory that you once created in Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Thank you for our family. Thank you for healing power. Yes. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for sustenance. Thank you, oh God. Our way in and <laughs> our way out. We're thanking you. Uh, been through a battle. And you kept us for a year. And that we are so thankful. Bless your name tonight. Bless your saints tonight. Mm. They are your people. In that wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. And we want you to uh, turn with us tonight. There are a lot of scriptures. It's just, just so much that I'd like to be able to cover and uh, difficult to cover in 45 or 50 minutes, but uh, all of the teaching and thus far, at least coming from me, has to deal with attitude. And attitude, I believe, <laughs> it was uh, uh, Jesse Jackson who stated in his con campaign to become president, uh, your attitude dictates your altitude and it's so amazing and at, at attitude really has to deal with the lens that you wear and the way you look at issues some say when you're looking at a glass is it half empty or is it half full some people attitude is to look at the negative part and the negative aspects others have a different attitude and they see things in progress. They see that something is uh, about to happen and to occur. And 
And so tonight we're going to deal with this and a combination and I hope that you can follow me in terms of the instruction. Follow me. There is a season, there's a time and a place. Ecclesiastes tells us that. There's a time and a season for everything and everything happens uh, in its perfect time in God. Uh, and uh, it tells us that very clearly there are times to build and then there are times to, to tear down, time to rejoice and then times to be sorrow, sorrowful. Also, we understand that there are some situations and, and, and issues where there are seasons in our life. And when there are seasons in our life, then we have to discern those seasons. And then there are times when we have to go after it. I mean, with all vigor and gusto. And then there are times we have to sit back and watch and observe. There are times to build and, and, and being able to discern uh, the seasons of our life, number one. So that's one issue. Understanding, discerning spiritually the seasons of our life. When to fight, when to lay down your, sh your shield and your sword. Then we're going to delve into something called the anointing. The anointing and glory. And what's the difference between glory and anointing. And there's a difference there. And you can't use those two terms interchangeably. Uh, certainly, uh, there is glory, the glory of God. And then there is something called the anointing or the anointed. So uh, can you be anointed and not in the glory of God? And Scripture tells us uh, when we are out of the glory of God, it's called Ichabod, which means the curse of the absence of the glory of God, Ichabod. Um, and that was a child that was named. And then there is something called the anointing. And the Bible tells us, uh, just one scripture comes to my mind, it says, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. And so, there's a difference between prophets. Uh, can prophets not be anointed? That's possible. <laughs> and still exist in the glory of God. And so we're going to address these issues and really to help you to understand um, that the anointed has power. They have power to announce seasons. Woo. The anointed has power to announce seasons, to start seasons, and to end seasons. Uh, there's a prophet by the name of Elijah. He walked with God, oh my, and he was able to tell Israel that there would be no rain. And when he said there was no rain, it didn't rain for three years. Oh my, he spoke it and it was so. And the Bible tells us about those who are so anointed that whatever they say on earth, God says, okay, in heaven. And what uh, is done in heaven, then they are able to speak a releasing. And tonight for all of you that are hearing me, by the various virtual uh, sites. It is your time for releasing. It's your time uh, because it is a season. We've come into a new season, uh, and that is prophetically a new season, but also it is the Passover. Hallelujah. It's called Nisan, N-I-S-S-A-N, which is the new year for Israel when God did a magnificent work for Israel. They were to continue in slavery for another 400 years. Uh, they, they were supposed to be enslaved, uh, but Moses called uh, through the angst and the insight of God that it was time for a Passover. And another word for Passover is 
new year, start again. Hallelujah. Restart. Uh, and so there are uh, authorities in heaven and there are authorities on the earth where you can call a new season. Hallelujah. Why you're worrying about the past when God is giving you the anointing to call a new season. Hallelujah. I'm calling a new season for you, for your family, for your children, for those on your job destined for something great. And so tonight, we want to deal with this anointed for this time. Hallelujah. Here's an anointing. And I know the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And so what we're experiencing uh, in some shape or form, it's been here. The world keeps turning. The glory of God keeps the world turning. But I declare to you tonight, there's an anointing, hallelujah, there's anointing in your mouth. There's an anointing on your tongue. And God is waiting for you to announce a new season. You were anointed for this noic and this, this issue that we've gone through for 365 days. Hallelujah. It's now time. Uh, to land this ark and get it on earth and redo, repopulate, and do what God has called us to do. And I'm telling somebody, even though we know it is soon, the Lord is soon to appear, but there's some more blessings for you. There's some more blessings you got to possess. Hallelujah. I'm saying it right now. And you're not going anywhere until those blessings come in to your house. I wish somebody would say right now, all these blessings are mine, and they shall come nigh thy dwelling. <laughs> oh my God, it shall come now. All you have to do now is realize that you are anointed for this time, and this is a season which uh, you must pronounce. I want you to read with me as I read aloud. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number three. And then we're going to shift from Jeremiah chapter number three to 1 Samuel number 16. These two chapters are uh, embiotic, it's symbiotic of all that we've gone through in the last uh, 365, 64 days um, uh, here in America, even in uh, the world. That God is still reigning supreme. He's still in control. Yes, there have been many deaths that we have experienced, but God is doing, he's doing a new thing. There's nothing new under the sun, but God is doing a new thing, something that we have not seen before. Here is what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 3, chapter number three, verse number one, commencing uh, at verse one, number one. And I want you to understand there is a difference between discernment and the visual and the emotional. Discernment, and you only get discernment by faith. It doesn't come by the number of years you've been saved. It doesn't come by eating a special food. It doesn't come by um, being in a special church. Discernment, it comes by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. It's in spiritual intuition. It's something that God has to download into our spirit. And when he downloads it into our spirit, it's our faith then that captures it. And so there is that discernment which is downloaded by God. It's never discovered. It's never recovered. It is downloaded by God. It's um, revealed. And revelation comes by God through the Spirit. And then there is this piece called the visual. Um, and so we are drawn to what we see, what we smell, 
uh, the attack town. Of course, you've heard this oh so many times. And oftentimes we are drawn by what we see, the energy that God gave us to be earthly and be connected. And then there is um, the emotional. And that really has to deal with uh, our sensory perception. Uh, it's, it's, it's how we respond to the issues that have been revealed or the issues that we see. Um, emotions, amen, somebody. Yeah. How emotions can get us into a world of trouble. Amen, your emotions uh, can get you into something for 15 minutes that will take a whole lifetime to get out of just because we were drawn um, and instilled by the emotional peace. And so here is Jeremiah and then also um, David uh, in 1 Samuel has an issue. The Bible says here, Jeremiah 3, chapter uh, number 3, verse number 1, and they said, if a man put away his wife and she go uh, from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Mm. Uh, Jeremiah, I mean, he throws a fastball right there in verse number one. And, and we're thinking that now he's getting ready to talk about marriage, divorce, separation, and how does that work? And he says, uh, shall not that land be greatly polluted, but those, but thou hast played the harlot? With many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Mm. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lean with. In the ways hast thou set for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness. And thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms, and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. Thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Here, here God, uh, through Jeremiah, begins to deal with Israel because Israel is in a backslidden state, and, and she just won't listen. And so God said, I've got to teach you a lesson. And uh, here Jeremiah, uh, he compares Israel to a wife that's become a prostitute. And that she rebels from her husband. Uh, she rebels against those things that are right and go out um, trying to do that which is wrong and that which is negative. And so here he says, therefore the showers have been withholden and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a horse for a head, thou refuses to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this Time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah, the king, hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there have played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not. But she returneth not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. <laughs> and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away 
and given her a bill of divorce me. Yet her treacherous sister, Judah, feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And here, uh, Jeremiah is, is explaining that Israel had been divided into two major capitals. And one capital actually went after a false deity and actually set up a worship in the synagogue of false gods. Uh, just incredible. And, and matter of fact, they offered bullocks and lambs and sheep um, to a false deity. And that smoke went into God's nostril. It caused God to be angered because Israel revolted against God. And as God had to deal with Israel, here is Judah sitting aside, watching them backslide and seeing what God is doing to Israel and whipping Israel. Judah also begins to backslide uh, simply because uh, both entities revolted against God. And so God said, you have played the harlot. You, you have given your body. You have given your soul to another nation. Mm, my God. And I'm going to write you a bill of divorce. I'm finished with you. I'm not going to mess with you anymore, Israel. I've kept you in captivity. I've whipped you. You've been shamed. And you're still going after false entities. I'm going to issue uh, to you a bill of divorcement, and I'm going to turn my back. And as he is issuing a bill of divorce against Israel, Judah is watching Israel backslide, and they do the exact same thing. And it came to pass through the lightness of our whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks, worshiping false entities there. And yet, for all uh, this, her treacherous sister, Judah, have not turned unto me with her whole heart, but fringently saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, the backsliding Israel have justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and Proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, Woo, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. And that not that amazing? That scripture, that verse right there reminds me of Psalm number 30, verse number 5. God said, my anger is just for a moment. Hallelujah. But if you turn to me, if you seek me, you may be weeping at night. But joy will come in the morning time. He said, look, you, you might be going through, but I will deliver you if you turn uh, yourself toward me. And, and verse number 13 says, only acknowledge what? Thy sin, thy iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers. Under every green tree ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And it's interesting. God said, I'm going to issue you a divorce. I'm getting rid of you. I'm not going to have anything to you. But in another vein, God says, even though you've whored, even though you've erred, even though you went after other things, I'm still married. Oh, my God. I don't want to tell somebody right now. God is married to the backslider, even those that used to be strong and used to be connected. God said, I should write you a bill of divorcement because you have gone seeking, searching, 
for other things that are definitely out of my will. Mm. But how many of you know that even when we backslide, there is an anointing mm. that will destroy the yeah. yoke? Oh, my mm. God. God said, I love you so much, even when you lose the anointing, I have an anointing that will break every diabolical curse, everything that you have done. All you have to do is say, Lord, I've sinned, I've done wrong, and, and, and turn back to me. Oh, my, my, my. He said here in verse number 14, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And this is the piece that I want to, to give you. He said, now, if you just come to me and you just repent, this is what I'm going to do. I will, verse number 15, give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understand. I want to stop right there. He said, now, if you turn, I'm going to give you some shepherds that are created and divinely trained and prepared after mine own heart that will feed you and bring you out of your whoredom. Let's turn real quickly to also 1 Samuel chapter number 16. And of course, many of you are familiar with 1 Samuel and, and the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, it really talks about uh, the life of uh, King David and also uh, the life of uh, Saul and the chronicles of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter number 15 and 16, of course, has to deal with uh, David and David's uh, family, Jesse, um, and where Israel has uh, erred again. You know, the preceding chapters, we see because they have erred, the Philistines are now coming against Israel, continuing to war against them. Now, Philistines are the relatives of Israel, according to Genesis, and uh, because there was a king who failed to destroy the enemies and, and, and instead of destroying them and wiping them out, um, this king uh, held on to some animals and, and also allowed the, the king that fought against them to survive. When God told them, I want you to wipe them out. And because they did not wipe them out two generations later, here are these Philistines, uh, distant relatives of Israel. They come after Israel because they don't forget. Let me tell you something right here. <laughs> if you don't get rid of that giant, if you don't get rid of your enemies, I'm not talking about killing them, but those things that are enemy to your spirit and soul, and, and you leave just a residue, oh my God, that residue might come back and get you. Amen. If you don't kill it, if you don't destroy it, hallelujah, mm -hmm. it'll grow into a giant. <laughs> and uh, this, these Philistines had a, uh, a man by Goliath. And the Philistines weren't known for giants. But because Israel didn't listen to God and say, I want you to wipe out this nation. Um, now, three generations later, now they have a giant who's saying, I'm going to take you into captivity. And you're not going to be able to do anything about it. But God says, I'm always going to have an anointing. <laughs> I'm always going to have something or somebody. I'm always going to have a time, a period, a season. Your enemy may threaten you. Your enemy may push you. Your enemy may harass you. But God said, I'm going to have an anointing. I'm going to have an anointing, and I'm going to have an anointing that's going to actually destroy the yoke or the burden in your life. So here we are, um, Samuel chapter number 16, 
First uh, Samuel chapter number 16, look at verse number one. The Lord said unto Samuel, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Why? Saul counted when God said, I want you to go into battle. Don't count the men, but Saul numbered the men. It's where we actually get the, uh, the, uh, the, the title of the book of the Bible called Numbers is really the numbering of Israel. And God said, I don't want you to trust in your strength, not in your financial resources or your ability to fight. I just want you to trust me and follow my instructions. Saul uh, then uh, went to a witch doctor, a soothsayer, Witch of Endor, trying to bring up a spirit to conjure uh, against uh, his enemy. And God says, you don't need any of that. <laughs> All you need is the anointing. <laughs> you got the anointing, it will destroy every enemy that you are fighting or you are prepositioned against. The Lord said unto Samuel, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Find thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with thee, a cow, female cow, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him who I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake. And came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? Uh, Samuel wasn't one of those, uh, you know, thermoglur, highly educated, uh, speaking very softly. Samuel was a hard prophet. I mean, he was telling folk, you know, God was going to cast him in hell. Um, he was just very rugged. And when they heard that he was coming and when he came to Bethlehem, they were concerned because not only could Samuel preach, he could fight too. <laughs> he would mess you up, would jack you up in a second. Oh my, I wish we could have some preachers like that today <laughs> that will tell you what God says and then jack you up. Hallelujah. And so they were just upset and then they were concerned. Why are you coming to Bethlehem? Are you coming to pronounce doom and gloom? Verse number five. And he said, um, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Woo! Get it now. He sanctified Jesse and his sons and then called them to a sacrifice. Oh, my, my, my. So before there's even an anointing, there's a sanctification. And what a sanctification means is there's a cleansing. So before there could be a sacrifice of this a heifer of this female cow, he says, now I want you to cleanse yourself. I want you to cleanse yourself so that the sacrifice can be accepted by God. So one of the first things in order to have the anointing, we've got to sanctify ourselves. Even in the book of Chronicles, it talks about sanctification. Uh, Chronicles 7 14, but even at that first two verses, talked about Israel sanctifying themselves. It means cleansing and purging, evaluating themselves. He said, now, after you have evaluated yourself, and as we read in Jeremiah chapter number three, uh, God says, now, I want you to repent. I want you to turn back to me. I want you to say that I'm sorry. That is a form of sanctification. It's purging ourselves. It's in Psalm number 51, 
talks about purging us with hyssop. It means we become self-examinatory and we look at ourselves. If we want to be anointed, we got to first come to God cleansing our mind, our body, and our soul. Remember what I said in the beginning um, when it comes down to the anointing, you got to understand that there's got to be a discernment. So it's not things that you can see with your naked eye, but it's something that God downloads. One of the ways that God downloads, whoo, talking to somebody right now. If you want God to download in dreams and visions and God to speak to you, you've got to sanctify yourself. Oh, you got to say, it's me, oh Lord, in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister. Lord, I want you to purge me with your word. Purge me with your blood. I want you to purify me. I want you to burn me. Hallelujah. And what will happen is that the Bible tells us in Joel 2 and 28 that in those last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters are going to prophesy and dream dreams and see visions. Your old men and your young men and your handmaidens will prophesy. God said, now when you sanctify yourself, forget about what happened yesterday. Forget about what happened 15 years ago. But if you just come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, uh, you know, I haven't thought right. I haven't acted right. I haven't. There, there are things that just weren't kosher with me, but I'm coming to you, Lord, because I know that if I repent, I can get oh, the anointing. And if I can get the anointing, then the anointing is going to destroy every yoke. So he says, now, sanctify Jesse, sanctify the sons, and then commence with the sacrifice. Why is the sacrifice important? Because it has to be something that is presented to God to offshoot your sin. Oh, my God. So when you bring to God your sin, but you got to offer a sacrifice of praise. Now, I'm not talking, telling you to go to the farm and buy a cow. Uh, no, 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 no. I can't afford one, and probably neither can you. But what I'm saying is this. Once you bring to God your issue, your trouble, your, your, your demise, those things that are not good and not like God, then you are to offer up a sacrifice. Sacrifice of praise. Yes. Oh, my God. Why a sacrifice of praise? Because he could have killed you. He yes. could have destroyed you when you were wrong, when I was wrong, and when I was weak, and, and, and abandoned God's philosophy, abandoned God's way. He said, now, if you repent and then give me a sacrifice, here comes the anointing. Oh my God. And I'm telling you tonight, you can do all three and get an anointing tonight that will change the destiny yeah. of your life. But I've got to say, Lord, it's me. It's me, Lord. I'm not trying to be something or be somebody. I'm not trying to act. I'm not trying to put on airs. You know about me, Lord. You know my mind. You you know uh, my inhibitions. You, you, you know my weaknesses. You you know all of those things that keep tripping me up. And Lord, I repent right now. And I need the blood. And, and once you begin to work on me, Lord, then I'm going to offer you a sacrifice. I'm going to come into the temple and give your name the glory. I'm going to give your name the praise. And after you give him the glory and to give the praise... That's when the anointing falls. Oh, my, my, my. Oh, 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 oh. The glory falls, but the anointing then is rubbed on. <laughs> oh, my God. I want the glory to fall because that initiates his presence. But then I want the anointing to be rubbed on. He says here in verse number six, And when it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Elab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So who, who is Elab? Elab is one of Jesse's older sons. So he says, well, God has always dealt with the oldest, and so probably it's Elab, and certainly he's masculine, he's fit, he's trim, he's the eldest. Certainly he has got to be the anointing. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance 
or on the height of his statue because I refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Oh, 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 come on, somebody. You are already blessed and you can be anointed not because of your pedigree, not because of your last name, not because of the money that you have and, and the position that you possess, but just because God said, I will rebuke and I will reject what looks holy and what looks good and what looks so important. I'm telling you, some of the most anointed folk have no position at all. Uh, the most anointed folk that I've come into my life many, many times, they're humble, they're meek, and it looks like they have no strength. And so God says, no, I, I don't want Elab. I know he's the eldest and he's strong, but that's not what I'm doing. I don't look on the outward appearance, but I look on the heart. And we know that David is a man after God's own heart. That's why he's anointed, because he's a man after God's own heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Now, that's interesting. He didn't say, neither has the Lord chosen him, but the Lord has not chosen this. <laughs> Oh, my, my, my. And that made me look a little harder at that scripture. It would have made sense because he rejected the older brother and said, him. But here is Abinadab. He said, I'm not looking at this. And so he wasn't looking at Abinadab as a person, but he was looking at the stuff that Abinadab was involved with. Oh, my God. God said, I don't look at the person, and neither do I look at the activity. I don't care how good you sing, and I don't care how good you preach. I don't care how you appear and the things that you're connected with. I reject that. I reject the good look. You know those folk that just know how to sing. Oh, my God. They just know how to preach. They just know how to teach. They, they know how to put the period at the end of the sentence. And God said, no, nah, that's not what I'm looking for. And I'm not looking for the person that has the physique. I'm looking for something that can be special. And then, and then the Bible says, and then Jesse made Shama to pass by. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to choose Shama. Uh, I'm not going to choose Abinadad. And I'm not going to choose the other brother because of his countenance. Oh, my, my, my. And then Jesse, uh, the Bible says in Tim, and again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till we come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was small, he was puny. That word ruddy means he's puny. And uh, he was a pretty boy. Oh, my God. I, it, probably another word could have been, he could have been. He looked probably a feminine. But you got to be careful uh, of judging the book by the cover now. Just, just because a person is small and it looks like they're weak and, and look like they can't take anything, most of the times that's the person that God begins to, to choose or he will anoint. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him, David, from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And I just want to stop there and we'll continue uh, to teach um, on, um, on next week here the Bible says Samuel anoints him and the power of God, the presence of God came upon David. So now we see the anointing, 
The glory falls, but the anointing comes upon. Glory represents presence. Hear this. Anointing represents to do, empowered to do. Supernatural strength. Yes. On next week, um, we're going to talk about a couple of things, and, and we've got it broken down, anointed for this time. When a person is anointed, God does several things. He anoints them for character, competence, calling. Character, competence, calling. Your anointing has to be, your calling has to be anointed. You can't do it just because everybody else is doing it. And, the, and, the, and, and that's, that's the dilemma. We have so many people that are trying to copy other folk instead of being an original. So God says, I'm going to anoint your calling. That means your purpose. Then I'm going to anoint your character. And your character is truly what you do when no one else is looking. And then when I anoint that character and I anoint your calling, then I anoint your competence. And hear this, you can have an anointing that no one can do what you can do like you do it. God will put an anointing on you and you can do things that others cannot do. And hear this also, there is an anointing that can destroy the present conditions or the present yoke. I believe that the apostolic church is gifted uh, in the 21st century to bring about a releasing, a destruction of those things that are plaguing the land today. So we, we're going to look at competence. We're going to look at calling. We're going to look at character. And then we're going to look at, <laughs> hear this, a public anointing versus a private anointing. And there is a great difference. And if you'll notice here in the scripture, David is not anointed in front of Israel. He's anointed in front of his family. Wow. And then comes an another anointing, a public anointing. So there's a private anointing versus a public anointing. And here's the problem and the dilemma with most apostolic churches. We have anointed folk publicly that have not been anointed privately. And when people have been anointed publicly, they fall because they have not been anointed publicly privately. David was anointed amongst his family. Mm, 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 mm. I want to preach it, but I got to teach it. <laughs> I really want to preach this thing. Um, too many people are being anointed publicly. Too many people are not willing. Hear this, and I'll close on this. You can be the first man in the second position. You can be the first woman in the fourth position because God's not looking at where you are positioned. When you are anointed, he brings you to the front. My God. He, he, he doesn't even have to maneuver. He just speaks it. <laughs> You can be the second man or the second woman, um, but God has anointed you for the first position. I want to tell somebody tonight, amen, you've been serving, but God is preparing you to be the head because you have an, an anointing. And anointing, that word anointed means misha. It means to be crushed. It means to be put upon. And so to next week, we're going to talk about this. We're going to really talk about these two types of anointing. We're going to talk about 
your anointing for your calling, anointing for your character, and then anointing for competence. When you know what you know, when you know it, and how you know it, nobody can beat you. You never have to compare yourself with anyone else. You don't have to fear uh, a competition or whether you're going to size up with someone. When you have been anointed for this time to resolve an issue or to come to the forefront or to release a curse in your family, that's really what I want to talk about. The ability to release curses. Release them, then to destroy them. I, I, I want the curse revealed. I want to call it out. But it's not good enough just to call it out. The curse has got to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. I got, And I'm anointed for this time to destroy the curse in my family. Mm -hmm. I am been created and anointed to speak to the issues and the problems of our community, of our society, for such a time like this. He'll bring us preachers, pastors of his own heart. Bless you. We love you so much. God is a good God. I hope it's 8 o'clock. Good time to stop. God has just been so good. He's been so merciful to all of us. I pray that God will bless you uh, for the rest of the week. Please remember um, that uh, to turn your clock forward on Saturday, uh, daylight savings time, make sure you do that so you're at the crystal on time and we can get in a good praise and get some good word uh, from the Lord. I love you. May God bless you. Please remember this. If you go with God, he will always go with you. God be with you and God bless you.